I proudly present to you uh, my former student, Tamar Meikin, who did her PhD uh, with me. Uh, Tamar now does uh, uh, work on similar, related uh, stuff to what she's done in her PhD, and she was the one who came to my lab and said, uh, I want to work on a completely different project than uh, what you have uh, been working up to now. And of course, I was reluctant to do this, but as you will see, she has the stubbornness and the stamina <laughs> to get things done. And uh, indeed, she uh, uh, was uh, started, initiated a completely different uh, uh, research line in, in, in the lab, which she's following now and uh, actually left with her <laughs> to some extent regarding uh, the body map, uh, the representation of uh, the body and integration of information, visual and uh, tactile information. And she's been working at the time with this, what you see here, the, what's called the glove, the rubber hand illusion. So illusions uh, in which you can fool uh, the uh, mind to think that your hand is elsewhere. Maybe she'll mention this, maybe not. But, uh, uh, and now she's in Oxford doing her PhD, uh, and she's going to tell us all about it. The PhD and <laughs> 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 I'm actually a physician now. Huh? Actually, I have my own lab now. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to show you some of my recent work, which I think is super cool. So hopefully no one would fall asleep uh, throughout the duration of the talk. The question I would like to present to you today is what happens to the cortical territory of the missing hand following arm amputation? We have known since the dawn of neuroscience that there are dedicated areas in the primary somatosensory cortex and primary motor cortex that are responsible for decoding inputs from the hand and transmitting uh, signals for motor control of the hand. So there's these vast brain areas that are dedicated for hand representations and following arm amputation, these areas become, so to speak, unemployed. And from a layman's perspective, you might expect that freeing up these brain areas might be really advantageous for the amputees. It might allow them to take advantage of these extra brain resources to maybe develop new skills to adapt to their disability. But uh, in fact, in contemporary neuroscience today, the prevalent thought is that reorganization at this level, at this scale, is maladaptive and is actually causing phantom pain. Phantom pain is pain that is perceived to be arising from the missing hand. Uh, by means of introduction, I would like to show you a short clip featuring one of my participants who will describe to you how it's like to experience phantom pain. <coughs> Lynn Ledger for Lord of Cocker, her arm. Zijn is veel last of phantom pain. I can feel the entirety of my phantom arm. To anyone looking at me, I have no arm. But I can feel the whole thing. I can feel the elbow, wrist, fingers. Imagine you're wearing an elbow-length evening glove. So it comes up to just above your elbow, and you've had the tips of the fingers cut off. Everywhere that glove touches your skin, it's crushing your arm. So the ends of your fingers are bulbousing out. It's crushing, crushing, crushing constantly. And then on top of that, you get pains like shooting electricity. You get burning pains like, like when you burn yourself on a grill. Your instinct is to pull your hand away. With these pains, you can't pull your hand away, so it's like keeping it there. It's a nerve sensation, and it simply stays there until it decides to go away. Phantom pain is extremely common in upper limb amputees. Up to 80% of upper limb amputees experience it, and it is notorious for being one of the most difficult neuropathic conditions to treat. The reason we are failing so badly in treating phantom pain is probably that we know very little about the neural mechanisms underlying it. Originally, phantom pain has been considered to be a disorder of the peripheral nerve system, and this is due to studies such as this, where the researchers were recording from the primary afferent of an amputee suffering from phantom pain. So this is the nerve that transforms information from the hand into the central nerve system. And what they found is despite the fact that the sensory organ itself is amputated, this nerve, this injured nerve, is constantly firing spontaneous activity. And this activity is actually increased if you tap the uh, nerve ending, which is a procedure that is known to increase 
phantom pain. So here's a very simple account of phantom pain. We have these nerves that transmit information to the central nerve system about sensation of touch and pain. Since the information is constantly transmitted, the central nerve system doesn't know that the hand is missing, and there go the, this is how we would experience phantom sensations and pain. This theory has been completely neglected and marginalized over the years, and this is because uh, when clinicians have been trying to anesthetize the end of the, uh, the, the nerve ending, this didn't really result in much pain relief. But I just want to very quickly highlight a study by Marshall DeVos group, where rather than anesthetizing the nerve ending, they anesthetized the dorsal root ganglion by the spinal cord. And this resulted in complete abolishment, not only of phantom limb pain, but also non-painful phantom sensations. So I think this result really highlights the potential of the peripheral nerve system in driving phantom pain. But as I said, this theory really doesn't stand at the center of neuroscience today. The main source that is attributed for phantom pain is plasticity in the somatosensory cortex. And this is probably originating from this very important seminal work published by Pons and colleagues in 91. What they've done here is record from neurons in the cortical territory of the missing hand in, amputee, in, amputee, sorry, in monkeys, which have been deafferented for several years. And what they found is that within this hand territory, neurons were responding to touch applied on the monkey's lower part of the face, specifically the chin and the lips. Based on this result, the notion that uh, the deprived cortex gets recruited by neighboring regions was uh, very strongly highlighted. In 1995, Herta Flohr and colleagues um, have been replicating this study in upper limb unilateral amputees. So they took human amputees, they applied touch on their lips on those sides, and at the time, uh, what they had available is electrical source imaging using MEG. So it's an ex extremely crude measurement to estimate the location of the representation of the lips. So they did this estimation, and they looked at distances between this estimated uh, representation of the lips and a, a separate representation, here the hand, and they just looked at crude distances, Euclidean distances, between these two representations. And what they found was that there was an almost perfect statistical relationship between the extent to which the representation of the lips was shifted towards the hand area and the amount to which people reported that they suffer or experience phantom pain. Based on this result, the maladaptive plasticity theory came forward. Based on this theory, following amputation, there will be sensory deprivation to the somatosensory cortex. This would trigger spontaneously cortical reorganization. This reorganization would lead to mismatches between some inputs and other inputs and outputs, which would be coded by the brain as an error signal and would be experienced by the person as phantom pain. This simplistic theory is hugely influential today, both in neuroscience circles and in clinical circles. And that's because it produces very strong predictions about how we can fight phantom pain. All we really have to do is sever this link of cortical reorganization. And the suggested way to approach this is try to reinstate the representation of the missing hand back into its cortical territory. And the most famous solution is this mirror box therapy where we use illusory visual information uh, of the missing hand to try and reinstate its representation. This theory now sits at the basis of many contemporary theories and applications for trying to treat lots of different chronic pain conditions, not only phantom pain. One issue I would like to raise with this theory is that it completely neglects the fact that we know that peripheral inputs may drive or shape phantom pain. So the starting point for me is trying to resolve between this notion that um, phantom pain is related with cortical reorganization and this earlier evidence showing that the peripheral system may continuously, continuously feed information relating to the missing hand. Before I get started, there's some terms I need to get out of the way. So I'll primarily show you results today from acquired amputees. These are people that used to have two hands, but they lost one of them. So they still have one hand, that's their intact hand, and they have the residual arm. This is the handless 
arm, whatever's left from the amputation, the stump. They also experience sensations, vivid sensations of the hand that is missing. And this is what we call phantom sensations, and this is the phantom hand. If these experiences are unpleasant or painful, we would say that this person is suffering from phantom pain. I will talk a lot about the deprived cortex. This is the cortical territory of the missing hand. So it's contralateral to the missing hand, and it is in the primary somatosensory and motor cortices. Let's assume for the purpose of the talk today that all amputees lost their left hand, so the deprived cortex would always be presented in the right hemisphere. I will also show results from two other groups. Control participants, these are just you know, simple people, two hands, uh, but matched for the clinical populations. And I will also show results from congenitals. These are people that were born without a hand. So they experience similar difficulties in daily lives in terms of adapting to their, um, to their disability, but they don't experience phantom sensations and they never suffer from phantom pain. I'll present the results today on these inflated surfaces of the cortex. I hope Udi got you used to those. So um, this is the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And on top of it, I'm drawing the um, sensory motor homunculuses. I see it through my control participants. So um, each, each blob here shows you areas that show selectivity for a particular body part. So these areas are feet areas. This is the arm area, which greatly overlaps with the hand area. And this is the lip area. And this is the central cycle, just for orientation. So the current theory today asserts that phantom pain is linked with reorganization of the lips into the hand area. So like anyone else in the field, I also looked at representation of lips in amputees and in controls. But unlike previous people, I'm going to use these inflated surfaces which allow me to actually account for the unique topology and anatomical boundaries of each individual participant. So here is a summary result. Each dot here shows you the center of gravity for representation of the lips in one participant. And the orange dots are for amputees and the purple dots are for controls. And I hope you can immediately see that the representations of the amputees are shifted compared to the controls. You'll see it better now. So the shift is medially from the lip representation towards the hand representation, which is completely consistent with any previous report in both human amputees and monkeys. Now, using these inflated surfaces, I can actually measure in millimeters the distances between representation of the lips and anchoring representation. And here we chose the, lip repres the feet representation. So we just look at this distance um, in millimeters. And the shorter the distance, the more remapping of the lips towards the hand representation. <coughs> yeah. Can you maybe explain what were the dots Yeah, the dots are uh, the center of gravity of the representation for lips compared to the feet um, in a 2D representation of the cortical surface. How about the size? So, so uh, po well, Pons would expect that the lips would take over the hand representation, and that would shift. Yeah. That would shift. We'll, we'll look at other measurements. Shift, both a shift and a size. We will, look, we will look at other measurements in a minute. OK. So what, yeah. Yeah. L let me just show you this graph. I think it contains the information that you're interested in. So this is the summary result. So we, here we have cortical distances of the lips to the feet. And what we see here is that there's a consistent reduction in, in the distance uh, for the deprived hemisphere compared to the intact hemisphere in amputees compared to control. So there's a significant interaction showing that the lips go towards the hand representation. But what I really want you to pay attention to here is the y-axis, which is the millimetric scale. These shifts, they may be statistically robust, but they are at the magnitude of seven millimeters, whereas the representation of the, li of the uh, hands from the lips is about six centimeters. So we are miles away from the representation of the hand. What uh, this graph shows us that, unlike what we might have expected from pawns of the lips jumping into the representation of the hands, 
whatever little shift there is of the representation of the elite, it is tiny. It doesn't really engage the territory of the hands. So the question still remains, what happens to the cortical territory of the missing hand following amputation? What, where can we look if we can't look at lip representation? And, um, well, if we want to look at representation of hands, why don't we take advantage of the fact that amputees experience very vivid sensations of their phantom hands? And, in fact, if you ask them to move their phantom hands, they can describe to you very vivid kinesthetic sensations, and they can tell you with great detail to which extent they can move each of their fingers, if at all. Here is a demonstration of one of my participants. This is Chris. He lost his hands 20 years ago. And what we're going to do with Chris is we're going to ask him to move his uh, phantom fingers in a tapping sequence, like so. And he's going to repeat the sequence five times, and he's going to count each time one sequence is completed. He's going to perform it under two conditions. In the first one, he's just going to imagine he's moving his phantom fingers. So this is something you guys can do as well. Just imagine that you're moving your fingers without actually engaging them in movement. And um, after that, my student is going to ask, them to ask him to switch to a real phantom hand movement, whatever real phantom hand movement may be. And one nice thing about Chris is because he has a low level of amputation, he actually has all the arm muscles that normally control the hands. So we can actually record with EMG and see if there's any preserved peripheral representation during phantom hand movements, imaginary and real. Okay. Chris is counting. It means he's performing the imagery task. And during this task, the EMG is very straight. The stump is quite relaxed. So he's counting, and now we don't really need to count on the counting. We can actually see uh, the EMG trace. Look at his stump. It's very active. Okay, so he went through five cycles of finger tapping. In each cycle, he moved from the thumb to the pinky. And as you can see, there's a very organized EMG uh, trace associated with the movements that is consistent, uh, and all I want to take from here is that when Chris is asked to perform phantom hand movements, he's actually sending a motor signal, he's actually engaging the motor system, he's actually sending transmission to the muscles. So now that we know that when Chris is performing a phantom hand movement, he's actually making a difference in his brain, we can try and see what happens in Chris's brain when he's moving his phantom fingers. And if there's one thing we're getting pretty good at at FIMRI, at my imaging center, is looking at representations of fingers. And that's because we have access to a 7T scanner. So this is a slide prepared by uh, James Kolniski, where uh, he's just taken one, um, one scan, five minute scan, an average of five minutes, where he's asking a regular normal participant to tap his finger on a button box on the index fingers, fingers in a sequence to the little finger. And as the participant is tapping away, we can see this <coughs> sweeping wave of activity along the central sulcus on this hand knob, which is the anatomical location of the hand. And you can see the wave is sweeping from lateral to medial. So we can now assign hard borders for preference shown for each of the fingers. And we're using that using the traveling wave approach of phase encoding. And this is an average over several scans. And as you can see here, um, there's uh, boxes showing selectivity specifically to each of the four fingers. And I should say that all of the maps I'll show you today are not masked. So this is uh, just thresholded maps. And you can see very clearly along the central sulcus representation for the index finger followed by the middle finger, the ring finger, and the little finger. This is the central sulcus. So anything anterior to it here would be the primary motor cortex. Anything in the sulcus and posterior to it would be the primary somatosensory cortex. And here are the subdivisions of the primary somatosensory cortex. And you can see that uh, we can identify nice snipes here in Boardman area 3A and 3B, and maybe some residuals in the higher divisions of the somatosensory cortex. So this is one participant. Here are completely random three participants that I pulled out of uh, 
James is Sisi. And um, as you can see, each of them shows a tiny little map that is shown here uh, in a magnified scale. And there's something common and consistent across these three maps. They all show selectivity for each of the four fingers. In each of them, the um, representation of the index finger is most lateral, and the pinky finger is most medial, and the order of the fingers is consistent with the order of the physical fingers. These maps are in somatosensory cortex predominantly, and that's because in somatosensory cortex we have the strongest, the, the maybe most organized topographic representation of the hand. But I hope you can appreciate that these maps are also extremely different from each other. There's a lot of variance. So uh, we scanned the same participants over a day and over four weeks, and what we find is that um, this variability within participants is actually beautifully preserved with exquisite details. As you can see, each of these maps look pretty much identical, despite the fact that there's four, four weeks between representations, uh, despite the fact that this is a motor task, so a dirty task for some other sensory people. So it appears that we have a method that is very robust in identifying topographies of hands in individual participants, which is exactly what I need when I want to look at phantom representations in amputees. So now that you've seen a few of these maps, let's, let's play a little game. So here you have two maps um, of finger wiggling. So it's not finger tapping, it's wiggling, so it's slightly more messy. The reason we need to wiggle fingers is because we can't tap phantom fingers against the button box. Well, not yet, at least. And um, I'm going to walk you through the maps, and what I want you to decide is which of these two maps belongs to Chris, the amputee that has a low level of amputation, and which belongs to a random control participant that is matched in age to Chris, okay? So the map that we see here, this is the central sulcus, and the color code here is for five fingers. So we have the thumb, the index, the middle, and the ring finger. And we have two maps, one close to M1 and one probably in area 2 of S1. So there's no pinky representation, but otherwise there's healthy looking maps. This guy here actually has all five fingers, so thumb, index, middle, ring, and pinky. But it's a bit more fractured. We have double representation of the thumb, both in the motor map and in the somatosensory map. Uh, there's double, triple representation of basically everything. It's a bit more messy, but it's a complete map. So raise your hand if you think this is Chris's map. OK. Who thinks this is the controls map? <laughs> well, <laughs> so come on, that's be daring. Wh which one is this? <laughs> okay, oops. You guys are lame. You have to you have to put the money where the word is. Okay. So um this is Chris's map. Unfortunately we didn't get we unfortunately we didn't get a, a pinky representation for him, but you know, the guy doesn't have a pinky, he doesn't have a hand. <laughs> so I'm not beating myself too much for it. Um, with Chris, you know, as I said, he has all these muscles that normally control the fingers. So when we saw that, you know, we were very impressed, but we also thought, well, who's to say that representation of fingers is the actual physical fingers? Maybe representation of fingers also involves representation of proprioception of these muscles. So fair enough, we got another participant. This guy is Mike. Mike has a high level of amputation. So he doesn't have any muscles in his arms uh, that normally control the, uh, the hand. Uh, Mike lost his hand 30 years ago in a farming accident. And um, here we have two maps. One is obviously Mike's phantom hand, and the other is his intact hand. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of information so you will be able to differentiate between the two maps. So listen up. So in this map here, we see the central sulcus, and we have one, two, three, four, five fingers, so a complete hand map. There's two representations here. In the depth of the sulcus, that's area 3A, and in the height of the gyrus, that would be 
Boardman area true. So these are the two proprioceptive subdivisions of the somatosensory cortex, very consistent with this finger wiggling task. This map here also has all five fingers, thumb, index, middle, ring, and pinky. Again, one in the depth of the sarcus, one in the height of the sarcus, so the two proprioceptive divisions. But there's also activation here in probably Brodman area 3B, which is an area that normally processes information from the surface mechanoreceptors on the skin. So who thinks this is the phantom hand map? Who thinks this is the phantom hand map? Okay, so this is the phantom hand map. It makes sense, it makes sense, it's consistent with the task we're asking the participant to do, but the important, uh, the important uh, point I want to take from here is that despite the fact that Mike didn't have fingers to wiggle while we're collecting this data, despite the fact that he hasn't had organized inputs from his fingers in 30 years, we still can produce these maps that exquisitely preserve all of the characteristics of normal hand representation in the somatosensory cortex to the extent <coughs> that when, you know, when we run statistics on these maps, we cannot distinguish between representation of the phantom hand or the intact hand or representation of the phantom hand compared to control participants. So there is a lot of maintained representation that people haven't really been accounting for because no one really has suggested to look at. And if you think about it, this is a pretty unique model allowing, the, uh, allowing us to tap directly into the original representation of this area, meaning we don't need to look at what the lip representation does. We can simply see what the hand representation does. So Chris and Mike are very unique in two respects. They have very good motor control of the phantom fingers, so they can move each of their fingers, and I think the proof is in the pudding here. Uh, but they're also 70 MRI safe, which is something is quite hard to find in amputees. So the rest of the talk would be in 3T, and the ability to move phantom hands is actually not something that is unique to these people. Every amputee I've ever met in my entire life that has phantom sensations with a bit of encouragement can perform some degree of movements with that hand. And here is a summary of uh, a bunch of amputees from another study where they're asked to move their phantom hands in the scanner. And this is a contrast map between phantom hand movements and feet movements. So it's a phantom hand specific map. And each and every one of these participants, well, uh, all of them but one, is able to activate this uh, cortical representation of the hand. So this is the hand knob on the central sarcus, and um, the, ex the, the extent uh, and the uh, crisp of the borders changes between participants, but as you can see, there's always a little something there which is very consistent with representation of the hand. So now we can actually pinpoint where is the cortical territory of the missing hand, and we can um, try and test some of the hypotheses relating to the maladaptive plasticity theory. So if you remember, the maladaptive plasticity theory asserts that sensory deprivation spontaneously trigger cortical reorganization, which would lead to phantom pain. Specifically, the theory focuses on representation of the lower part of the face, so the lips invading the hand area. This means that when I look at lip representation within the hand area, I should expect to find increased activity in amputees compared to controls, and that this increased activity would scale with phantom pain. This is the essence of the theory. Let's look at some results. So this is activity from the hand representation in amputees and controls. And I hope by now you're not surprised to see that there's no differences between the two groups. So Udi, if there was some um, uh, shift towards the hand that we were, didn't capture with the previous measurement, it should be reflected in levels of activation. We also find no statistical relationship with phantom pain, not with this measurement, and any other measurement relating to lip representation we've ever tried. What about maintained representation? So the maladaptive plasticity theory asserts that reorganization leads to pains. This means that in amputees there should be reductions in maintained representation and that this should either have nothing to do with phantom pain or if we really want to test drive the theory, we would say that people who suffer from worse phantom pain have more reorganization 
therefore, less maintained representation, so a negative correlation. This is the data here. We don't find differences between amputees and controls. This example is not a great one because I've taken a shortcut and the ROI is a bit biased, so you'll have to take my word for it. We don't find differences between amount of activity for the phantom hand compared to the intact hand contralaterally. But we do find a really nice correlation with phantom pain magnitude. So people who suffer from worse phantom pain actually show greater activity um, in the hand area when they're moving their phantom hand. We also looked at gray matter volume. It's a measure of um, the juiciness of the uh, gray matter, if you will. And specifically within the hand area, we find reductions in gray matter volume, which is consistent with the notion of degeneration. But despite these reductions in gray matter, we still find correlations with phantom pain. So people who suffer from worse phantom pain, these are the people with the increased representation, also have greater gray matter in this area. In fact, normal levels of gray matter if they suffer from very intense phantom pain. Yeah. How do you decide what to, when you measure phantom hand activity? Yeah. It's activated, I suppose it's, it's uh, bold activation. Yeah. Right? Now, it obviously depends on your region of interest. So how, mm -hmm. you how do you define that to make sure that this is the... Uh, yeah, so the region of interest one was defined based on a conjunction analysis between amputees moving their phantom hand and control participants moving their non-dominant hand. So this is a hand representation, but we have replicated the exact same results when we take the ROI just from the control population moving their non-dominant hand or from the amputees moving their intact hand and flipping uh, the ROI to the other hemisphere. So it's a very robust uh, correlation, and of course we can also see it when we do a whole brain analysis. Okay, we also looked at um, functional connectivity between the two hand areas. This is a measurement that we take at rest while participants are just lying in the scanner, not doing anything in particular. And what we do is we look at the uh, spontaneous fluctuations in the bold signal associated with one area, let's say one hand area, and we see to which extent these fluctuations correlate with spontaneous activity in a spatially dissociated brain area, for example, the other hand area. In control participants, the two hand areas are normally very strongly coupled. In amputees, this coupling is reduced. Importantly, this measurement also correlates with phantom pain. So people who suffer from worse phantom pain, these are the people with the apparent preserved structure and function, they actually show reduced levels of functional connectivity. Now, if we take these three results together, this profile fits perfectly, I think, with this notion of aberrant inputs, let's say from the periphery, feeding into the central nerve system, contributing locally for preserved representation, therefore more metabolism and preserved structure, but functional isolation. And that's because phantom sensations, by definition, are completely dissociated from the external environment. Think about Lynn describing how she feels like her hand is on the grill, but she cannot pull it away. This is the nature of phantom sensations, whereas the rest of the sensory motor system is normally coupled and synchronized by external experience. So based on these results, we can now make completely new predictions about the neural correlates of phantom pain, and we can test them. Uh, how are we doing with time? Does anyone know? Oh, I think I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> technology. So, going back to this idea that um, the inputs, the aberrant inputs of phantom pain would dissociate the cortical territory of the missing hand from the rest of the system, this means that if, if, if I can somehow artificially enhance or increase phantom pain, this should result in further dissociation of this area from its network. Now, this is something we've accidentally done. So we uh, ask a bunch of participants to move their phantom hands for about 20 minutes. Um, this was a part of a greater study uh, designed to help them, but uh, it turned out after 12 participants that this causes significant pain increases. We can discuss why that might happen later on. But the, the bottom line is that we have resting state scan before and after this procedure that increases their pain. And now we can see where we, whether we find further dissociation between the, the ter territory of the missing hand of the rest of the brain. So this is a, a, a pre-post contrast map. So the clusters that you see here 
uh, areas that become functionally decoupled from the territory of the missing hand. And you can see that these areas involve the uh, central sacus of the opposite hand as well as the supplementary motor area. We can replicate the same analysis I've shown you before. So these are the two hand areas. And you can see that uh, before this procedure, they had some baseline level of functional connectivity. I should say it's not a very high level of functional connectivity for this region. And that this connectivity was further decreased following this procedure. So at least we see that there's some coincidence between increases of phantom pain and functional decoupling between the two hands. But as I mentioned before, our purpose was not to increase phantom pain. We actually wanted to try and design treatments for phantom pain. And based on this theory, what we really need to do is uh, reinstate the cortical territory of the missing hand back into its network of origin. And we want to increase connectivity. And one, one technology for that might be transcranial direct current stimulation. So here we pass very low excitatory current into the deprived cortex while amputees are performing phantom hand movement. <coughs> and what we want to see is uh, following this treatment, if more areas are now become involved in controlling the phantom hand. So this is a task-based map and it's contrast between post and pre. So the colored regions here are areas that become more engaged, more activated following this treatment compared to before. And as you can see, this involves areas around the deprived cortex, so primary motor cortex, premotor cortex, the higher level areas of the primary somatosensory cortex, as well as the SMA. So all of these areas are now more engaged following these phantom hand movements coupled with excitatory stimulation. Importantly now, we can look at the pain rating. So without stimulation, as I've described to you before, this procedure increases their pain. Together with stimulation, this increase of pain is prevented. So it appears, or I would like to interpret it, as if um, being able to engage more sensory motor areas relating normally to hand function would dilute this contribution of these aberrant inputs. Now, I would like to mention, I would like to mention that these are early days. We only have 12 participants and the analysis is not finalized yet. So take this with a grain of salt, but it is hard for me not to get excited about a potential treatment for phantom pain. Yes, Udi? I have a question. Do you see that the missing hand in both sides or the, 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 the contrail to the amputated uh, limb? Or yeah, so the excitatory electrode is placed on the phantom cortex, so contralaterally to the missing hand, uh, and the cathode electrode is in the orbital frontal bridge. So we're only exciting the uh, deprived cortex. Well, you want to excite them both? I mean, what you're saying, are you trying to generate greater connectivity between the two sides? Is that the so this is the, the T TDCS uh, excitability is extremely diffused. It's like passing a current through a watermelon. So the current uh, would be greatly diffused. So you're not just specifically exciting that cortex. You're exciting pretty much you know, a third of the hemisphere. No, no, I said, I, said, I said between the cortical territory of the missing hand and its network of origin, so the sensory motor system. So, ah, so for so example, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What you showed before was between the two sides, right? Yeah, yeah, and we also... Uh, the relations between the two sides, because it's also... Triangle. Yeah, so, so this is, so functional connectivity between the two hand areas is a hallmark uh, for, for a healthy functional connectivity profile. Uh, for a healthy brain. This is a contrast map so for task-based. So here we just, if, we, if I would show you here activity ipsilateral, you should get worried. I'm doing something wrong for these participants. So this is a more healthy, normal profile of activation. Well, you also saw the difference in the rock, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's an important, it's an uh, important confound that uh, is important to address. Uh, the way for us to account for that is when we do these whole brain maps, 
not in this one I'm showing you, but you know, as, as means of validation, we would also uh, include the VBM results, box or Y, for each participant as a confound regressor of no interest, just to make sure that the changes in VBM are not underlying these functional connectivity changes. Yeah. Is the pain rating, uh, so placebo is in fact increasing the pain rating. Yeah. Is it if you compare placebo with a simulation, what would be the control level pain rating? So th this is a change. So the zero doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that these people, so I did not treat phantom pain. I did not cure phantom pain. These people it still. Didn't make it worse. Exactly. <laughs> But look, I mean, um, the way I want to sell it is saying um, phantom pain fluctuates. And if you could just reduce the gain, if you can prevent it from increasing, then you've already gone a long way in helping these people. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that the absence of imagine moving their hands cannot be done. So they had to perform real hand movements, not, I not imagine hand movements. This was just to demonstrate to you that there's something conceptually different in the peripheral nerve system for imaginary movements compared to real hand movements. So we did not ask them to imagine in, in this task. We did ask them in the 70s study, and we don't find any selectivity for fingers in the imaginary task. Yes, exactly, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we've also had a control condition where we pass the current in a different brain area, that's the intact brain area, and we, I, I'm not showing you the ANOVA here, um, just simply because um, we haven't run it yet, but there is no, no difference, so the, the maps are clean. So it doesn't seem to be related to the simulation itself. Okay, so to summarize these parts, I think I want to... Um, suggest a very modest take-home message. If you're interested in representations of the hands, do not waste your time studying the lips, okay? But I'm, as a side note, I just want to say that according to the classical uh, homunculus, um, the representation of the lips is not a cortical neighbor of the hands. So even these simplistic theories of um, deactivation wouldn't necessarily explain um, this seminal result of Pons and colleagues, and we still remain with this really interesting result where monkeys that have been deafferented uh, now show activation within the cortical territory of the missing hand when touch is applied to their face, and I think this requires some further thinking. So um, let me propose to you a completely speculative alternative explanation to this key result. The monkeys who have been deafferented had to live for several years with their disability in their cages. And it's possible that this required them to develop compensatory behavior because they were quite severely disabled. And as monkeys do, it's possible that they were taking advantage of, of the mouth and their chin in order to perform daily monkey tasks. And it's possible that this behavioral pressure might have shaped or led in some way to this enhanced representation of the face in the cortical territory of the missing hand. So we wanted to see if we can find similar evidence in humans. So the first thing we had to do is observe our amputees and see how they behave in the natural world. So this is, this is my lab, it's not a natural world, but uh, this is a very simple task that we gave uh, participants, just open a bottle of water as fast as you can. And these are just four random participants that each of them adopted a different strategy to perform this task. So the person up here is taking advantage of his residual arm and his torso to hold the bottle. The person down here, who has the same level of amputation, is actually holding the bottle with a myoelectric prosthesis that he's controlling with his distal arm muscles. The person here also has a prosthesis, but he's not using it at all. He's actually taking advantage of his thighs. It doesn't really work for him, so he goes down, uses his feet to hold the bottle person up here has the same level of amputation, is using his mouth to open the bottle. So there's a great wealth of behaviors that we can observe in the lab, and we wanted to capture some of this complexity. So we focused here on upper limb strategies for compensatory behavior. What we've done is we equipped our participants with accelerometry monitors, 
and they had to wear them around their arms, and they uh, just had to go about the usual daily routine for a few days while we were collecting this data. And from this, we calculated a very crude, very simple measurement of laterality, how much they use their intact arm above and beyond their residual arm in daily tasks. And what we found, uh, and it was a very striking uh, effect, and we could kind of guess it by looking at people in the lab, is that acquired amputees, people that lost their hand later in life, they have an intact hand, they've used it as a hand their entire life, they're just going to use it some more uh, after the amputation. So they exhibit an extremely lateralized pattern of behavior, whereas the uh, congenitals, these are the people that were born without a hand, they are actually much better at utilizing their residual arm in daily tasks. So they incorporate it more specifically in by manual tasks. So based on this result, we can make some very simple predictions about the scope or opportunities for adaptive plasticity in amputees. We would say that the body part that is being relatively utilized to compensate for the disability should gain from overrepresentation in the brain, be it the intact hand for the acquired amputees or the residual arm in the congenitals. So this is a super simple fMRI study. I put everyone in the scanner, and I asked them to move their hand like so. So everyone has a hand. The acquired amputees and the congenitals have their intact hand, and the control participants have the dominant hand. And they perform this simple movement. And I ask from the entire brain, where can I find increased representation associated with the intact hand of the acquired population, the regular amputees, compared to the congenitals and the controls? So this is a whole brain analysis. There's only one cluster that we find in the cortex that meets these requirements. And this cluster beautifully overlaps with the hand representation as we see it in controls. So this is the hand area that shows increased representation in the acquired amputees compared to the other two groups. But look carefully. This is the deprived hemisphere. So this is the hemisphere contralateral to the missing hand. This is the cortical territory of the missing hand and it is ipsilateral to the hand that the participants are actually moving in the scanner. We can see it very clearly here in this region of interest, which is independent. Control participants and also congenitals, they don't show uh, ipsilateral activation when they're moving their hand. It's a classical result. The acquired amputees show positive activity, which is greater compared to the other two groups. So they are able to utilize the cortical territory of the missing hand while they're performing hand movements of the intact hand. Now, what about the residual arm and the congenitals? So, again, very simple condition. Everyone's moving their arm as so. We only use amputees with below the elbow amputation. And here again, we ask where in the brain is there increased activity for the congenital moving the residual arm, which they use more in daily tasks, compared to the other two groups? And again, a whole brain analysis, one cluster, beautifully fits with the hand area. I couldn't have photoshopped it better myself. See how the cluster avoids the boundaries of the arm area and is very specifically located in the territory that is more um, prominently selective for hand representation. This is the missing hand representation, so the hand that they've never had, the congenitals. And for them, whenever they're moving the residual arm, they can activate the neighboring cortical territory of the missing hand. So we found this result. So we, sorry, we also ran in our eye lab. It's the same eye as you've seen for uh, the acquired. And um, amputees and congenitals showed some level of activity in this area when they're moving their hand. As we said, there's some overlap between hand and arm representation. But this activity is greater in the congenitals. So we were, yeah. These two maps show areas which are voxels which are in both maps, correct? And these are opposite contacts. So am I missing something? Why no, this is the marvel here. So what we see is that the cortical territory of the missing hand becomes recruited to represent inputs from the body part that is relatively overused, be it the intact hand in the acquired amputees or the residual arm in the congenitals. So for the congenitals, it's a very short trip. They just have to move from here to here. Exactly. Here they have to jump all the way from here to here. And bear in mind, this is the population that lost their hands as adults. So the more maybe striking plasticity is actually apparent in adults. 
No, but, yeah. but they had it from the beginning. They only had to increase it. They didn't have to move from the other side to this side. Uh, they don't. So this this is not different from uh, from um, baseline. So there's there's no ipsilateral representation normally. Uh, in the brain, there is ipsilateral. <laughs> 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 So I have the question is what happens, right? Because it exists in our in your brain. Mm -hmm. There is some monkey brain. Yeah. I'm detection. No, I'm sorry, human brain. Yeah. So there no, let me correct too you. Too many evidence to ignore. Let, let, let me correct you. There's information ipsilaterally, as we see in Dedersen's work and also um, uh, both his earlier work uh, and his current work with MVPA. There's information stored, but if you look at average activity, which is a simplistic univariate analysis that I'm showing you here, all studies show that activation actually starts negatively when you're young and goes to baseline, to zero, well, as you get old. Neural activity. Well, it doesn't matter, but yeah, but, but you agree that there is some activity when you move your arm, mm -hmm. the two sides of the brain are activated in some way, a little bit, in the HP and more in the corner. Now, you I don't need to move <laughs> the whole thing, you just need to use I, I agree that there's communication between the two hand areas through colossal uh, connection. But uh, yeah, we, we can discuss yeah. that later. Yeah, so that's <laughs> part of the story. So I, you know, this is a very fancy plasticity we see here, but we were actually focusing on this one here. And that's because um, this, uh, this activation comes to life whenever the participants are performing coordinated by manual movements. So think about it. Each time, you know, they're opening a bottle of water or whatever, they're actually activating the cortical territory of the missing hand using their stump. And we wanted to see how this relates to whole brain connectivity. So this is, again, a resting state functional connectivity analysis. Uh, it is carried by Avital Chachami from the Wiseman Institute. And here is a very, very basic analysis. Avital takes the cortical territory of the missing hand or the non-dominant hand in controls, and she asks, where in the brain can we find differences in connectivity between this area and each and every one voxel between controls and congenitals? Unfortunately, we didn't find any increases in connectivity, but we did find a very marked decrease, which is very specific <laughs> to the opposite hand area. So here is again the control hand representation, and here is um, these voxels that show reductions in connectivity. And here is an independent re region of interest showing that uh, the congenitals, we call them here one-handed, show reductions in connectivity between the two hand areas compared to controls. I would hardly call these news. These people were born without their hands. But that's not we, what we were after. What we really wanted to know is whether the way they utilize the residual arm in daily tasks would affect this reductions in connectivity. So now our vital would repeat the exact, exact same analysis, this time only for the congenitals, but she would also add a regressor uh, for how much they use the residual arm in bimanual tasks. So we're looking across participants to voxels that um, dynamically across participants change their connectivity to the missing hand cortex depending on how much people use the residual arms. So. Well, I haven't, shown you, I, I haven't shown you any changes uh, in the congenitals, and in fact, we never found changes in uh, VBM in this cortical ter of the territory of the missing hand in congenitals. So um, again, we're looking at connectivity between this area and every other voxel in the brain, but now we're looking whether these variability, v changes in connectivity across participants scale with usage. And again, a very clean resource, one cluster, in the homologous area in the other hemisphere, nicely overlapping with the hand area. And here is the independent region of interest. So within this area, from the entire brain, individuals that use the residual arm more frequently for bimanual tasks show higher levels of functional connectivity between the two hand areas. And my favorite result is probably this little red line here. This is the mean and confidence interval of connectivity between the two hand areas in controls. And you can see that the congenitals show reductions in connectivity, and you can see that, that they show greater variance. But those individuals that 
use the residual arm a lot. So 80 or 90 means that 80 or 90 percent of the tasks we uh, were studying, which were by manual, they were actually taking full advantage of the residual arm. These people actually show normal level of functional connectivity. And this I find fascinating because these people were born without a hand by simply by the fact that they're using their residual arm more, they can actually normalize brain connectivity. And I think it's a very positive message for future strategies for rehabilitation because it suggests that it doesn't matter so much what body part we have, it's more important how we use it in daily life. So uh, to summarize, um, I would like to conclude that brain organization and reorganization in amputees, in the deprived cortex, and also more globally, seems to be driven by experience. There's a lot of talk in my area about spontaneous plasticity. We may find hints for it when we look at representations of lips, but to me, this here is a red herring. It really diverts our attention from what's really happening in the cortical territory of the missing hand. I don't think these mild shifts have anything to do with uh, what happens within the hand area, and that's because within the hand area, we find a lot of maintained representation. We find that the representations of individual fingers are exquisitely preserved. The topography is completely intact despite decades of deprivation. We also find that levels of activation in this area relating to the phantom hand scale with phantom pain with potential implications for treatment of phantom pain. We also find that the deprived cortex is extremely plastic so long as we look in how people behave. We see that behavior shapes reorganization in the deprived cortex uh, if they're born without a hand, but also if they lose their hand later in life. And again, I think this is um, an important positive message for um, future treatments for neuro rehabilitation. I would like to thank all the many people that have helped uh, with these various studies, particularly the students of Sane, who's been running the Preserve Presentation Studies, James, who's been setting up a lot of the seven Tesla work, uh, Melvin, who's been helping a lot with the Phantom Pain Studies, um, Avital Khachami from the Wiseman Institute has been uh, leading the research with the congenital functional connectivity. I also want to mention Irene Tracy and Heidi Johansenberg, the current and future directors of FIMREB, who have been supporting this work from day one, and uh, my ever multiplying funders. So we've done, we, we've run a VBM, uh, sorry, DTI analysis in uh, both populations. Um, there's nothing straightforward that pops out, so it's not like the corpus callosum is different, uh, where we do find more subtle changes of um, 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 decreases in the uh, deprived cortex compared to the intact one is actually in the corticospinal tract. And in the corticospinal tract, we also find some relationship with usage. So people that use their intact hand more, these are people that show increases ipsilateral activation. They also show greater um, tractography between the, between the subcortical and the cortical <coughs> uh, motor areas. I had some impression, I may be completely wrong, so correct me, that when you ask us the question to say who is the control and who is the, the patient mm -hmm. or, or which they like, the difference was not in the amount of representation, mm -hmm. but in organization of the representation. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that in the healthy uh, existing hand, yeah. with the, it is less organized than the space. Yes. So, so far, the analysis of organization we were looking at, which is, you know, MVPA, more subtle analysis, doesn't find, we can't find any differences, but um, we, we do have this hypothesis that if people um, get less experience, then there will be less variability, and therefore, maybe more organized maps. But this is um, 
a relatively new finding that we haven't been able to uh, di decipher yet. Finding. Yeah, so this is our next study starting in the summer. Well, I want to go back to the pond study. I mean, the fact about the pond study is that they tried to map the hand area mm -hmm. and they saw that the cells were not responsive there, right? But, but how, do you activate, how do you activate the cells for hands if the hand is uh, deafferented? Okay, so that's the question I wanted to ask. I mean, so I, I think you, you mentioned that if you uh, uh, press the thumb in areas, you can actually, I mean, first of all, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, phantom pain or phantom sensation, yeah. if you touch the thumb, can you, uh, can you induce phantom sensation? In some, pe in some people, yeah. so phantom sensations, they're not well localized. Sorry, phantom pain is not very well localized, so let's stick to phantom sensation. Yeah, yeah there's, you know, there's a subset of uh, amputees that would report that when you touch particular uh, parts of the stump, that would act elicit sensation of individual digits. And this is very consistent with the idea that when you uh, amputate the nerve, it would spontaneously leach to uh, some muscle and uh, there would be, uh, that would result in some uh, transmission of input and output. Uh, but this wouldn't be for me preserved representation because this is, you know, just uh, feeding information from the medial and ulnar nerves, radial nerves into the, into the central nerve system. So it, it, it doesn't really qualify as preserved representation. What we have done to address that is we've found uh, one participant, one amputee that has complete brachial plexus abulsion. So he doesn't have any input and any outputs from the periphery. And we wanted to see if, if with a person that there's absolutely no information from the periphery, there's still a preserved map. And he's been amputated for 25 years, and we find a preserved map with him. So that suggests that the preservation doesn't really um, relate or, or um, piggybacks on any peripheral input. So, so let me understand. You say, OK, with these monkeys, presumably they don't have uh, phantom sensations. We won't know, of course. But that is the reason why the hand area is not active because they were recording from single neurons and they find that it is Well, they, they, they didn't ask the monkeys to move the phantom hands. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume that monkeys don't have phantom sensations. Why wouldn't they? So, but they, I mean, there, there's a, a, a major contradiction between what they find in the monkeys and your case, right? In your case, you find that the hand area in, in the hemisphere contralateral to the uh, amputated hand mm -hmm. is intact. The hand representation is intact. But at the same time, well, there's the also but yeah. at the same time there's also adaptive plasticity. So we find both preserved representation <coughs> and new representation of the intact hand. I have a very specific <coughs> explanation. Yeah, please. Monkeys, unlike humans, they have uh, they were denervated, right? So yeah. In the two hands or in one? No, hand? one hand. Ah, in one hand. Yeah. Because it's uh, fits in I my explanation. <laughs> they, they, if they really like to use the hand that was uh, denervated, they would use the lips to lick mm -hmm. yeah, on the floor. Yeah. That's it. And that's why you see. That's what she suggested. Yeah. That they had a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Humans, that don't do it. Actually, <laughs> amputees <laughs> use their mouth a lot. Yeah. Whole cortex mass, I should say. Whole <laughs> cortex mass, okay. Um, I was surprised I didn't see any uh, sign of activation in secondary F2, mm -hmm. somatosensory cortex, or in the insular cortex, mm -hmm. which I presume was represented in the map, mm -hmm. even though there are people now pushing that as, as the primary yeah. main cortex. Any comments? Yeah, so. Um, when we just look at phantom hand movements, if we reduce the threshold, we find s secondary somatosensory cortex. Uh, when we look at whole group, we also find some activity in the insula that we wouldn't see in control participants. So we definitely see some insula activity associated with phantom hand movements, but I think that probably relates to the fact that when they move their phantom hands, it increases their phantom pain. Yeah. 